Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to Buck Now Fellowship. Hi. Uh, we're going to get started. We're going to continue our Bible study through the book of Acts. Uh, and we're going to continue to go through. Uh, now, we know Acts, uh, the early part of Acts is a book that's written for us and for our learning. Uh, and it's not written to us and it's not talking to us or about us. Uh, but most Christians like to use this as doctrine. Uh, but as we go through, we'll be able to see it. Uh, I, I was talking with, d d just thinking about, uh, looking at a preacher online the other week, and oh man, it, it, it really, uh, it really gave me more motivation to want to be able to, to teach the word right and divide it. Because there's so many people who uh, are studying and teaching God's word, and the people that are sitting under this church had about 20,000 people. And there, he said that we're in the, we have a new covenant right now, and that Jesus, when he comes back, he'll step foot on the earth, and then we'll meet him in the air. So, mm -hmm. uh, so he, I mean, he's mixing all kind of stuff with everything. I mean, it, because when he comes back and sets foot on the earth, that's a totally different thing than when he'll come back and meet us in the air. And he puts, he says, Acts two and four is when God gave us the new covenant. Mm -hmm. So, so when you hear teaching like that, it makes you want to. Uh, want to teach the Bible and teach it rightly divided because there, 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 there's a lot of Paul says if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost because the prince of this world blinds their minds and he does it through religion uh, because people get to a church where they feel good, uh, the emotions are running high, but the they have a zeal but it's not according to knowledge. Uh, so, so we're going to get into this. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of verses and then I'm going to pray. Uh, Acts chapter number three. We finished up chapter number two last time. And uh, before I get started, uh, I wanted to clear something up. Last time we were talking about the Jews, and this that's going to be out here in the Cajun program. Uh, and I, I, I don't think I was clear on it uh, when going back and looking at the video. Uh, anybody now today, whether you're Jew or Gentile, also there's no difference. Anybody today, if you're saved, you believe uh, that Jesus Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again, you're saved uh, by, the, by pure grace, uh, separate from any covenant. You're saved by pure grace, and you become the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. You become a part of the church, the body of Christ. And that's for anybody. Now, those Jews who, who are still on this program, they don't, they, they're ignorant of this program. But anybody today, whether Jew or Gentile, can be saved because this is the only righteousness of God today. Even back here, the only righteousness of God was that of the law. Mm -hmm. So to be saved, you had to believe Israel is your Messiah, and you had to be water baptized and all those things. That was this program over here. So but we know that the righteousness of God has moved from faith to faith. Uh, uh, let's go to Acts chapter number 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, then the ninth hour. And a certain man lying from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who say Peter and John about to go into the temple asking alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you now giving you thanks. Father God, we thank you for uh, uh, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Uh, we thank you for newness of life. We thank you that we're able to walk uh, in salvation and as a present possession according to your faith uh, and according to your work on the cross. We thank you for uh, salvation. We thank you for uh, we thank you for freedom, O oh God, because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and we thank you for that freedom. Uh, we thank you that we're not tied to the circumstances and the cares of this world, but this world is, is evil. Uh, and Father God, Jesus Christ will come and deliver us out of this present and evil world. And we thank you for it. Uh, we ask you to just touch everybody here, open the minds of understanding and enlightenment, uh, touch the situations, the, the circumstances, the, 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 as the, the things that are coming upon us, oh God, as we're trying to live and do your will. We ask you to touch now. Strengthen us right now, God. Strengthen us right now. Give us the grace that's sufficient to, to no matter what we're going through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, as we see this, now as we're reading this, we understand uh, in the book of Acts, Paul, uh, Peter is given an account as to uh, 
how Israel is to be saved. He said that he gave them prophecy and he gave them some things uh, that the prophet Joel had spoken to them that they should have known as far as what's to be saved. And in Acts 2.38, the famous scripture in Acts 2.38, we see uh, that Peter giving them, they asked Peter, well, how, do we, or how are we saved now? And Peter said, you have to repent, be water baptized, uh, then you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, and those things. Now we understand as we come into Acts chapter 3 that even that repentance water baptism and then receiving of that Holy Ghost, they won't receive that until out here. Right? Because who will come and baptize them with the Holy Ghost? Jesus, Jesus Christ. So we know that they're just being prepared to repent, be water baptized, then they shall receive it. So they're just getting prepared for what's out here. So as we see this, it says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Now we saw that the ninth hour is, uh, uh, according to the Jewish calendar, the ninth hour is about, because the Jewish calendar goes by three, so from six to nine is the uh, third hour. Three uh, is, is the third hour. As I think it's in Acts 2 and 14, I believe it is, 2 and 11. Yeah, 2 and 14, Peter standing up. He dreamt with the word. Uh, yeah, but these are not drunk in the third hour. So as we see that the third hour is the first watch of the day in the Jewish calendar from 6 to 9. So then you have 9, the, uh, the, the third hour, and then you have the sixth hour is from uh, 9 to 12, and then from 12 to 3 is the ninth hour. So it's still in the middle of the day when he's talking here. Uh, notice that it says uh, Peter and John. Now whenever God sent them out, he always sent them out in two. Right, so notice that. Then also notice it says, they entered into the what? Temple. temple. <laughs> notice that the temple is the center of worship in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. They always went back to that temple and what they call a holy convocation every year. So most churches that speak about the holy convocation, mm -hmm. they're trying to be spiritual Israel. That's not your program. Because uh, uh, the Bible speaks about it in Leviticus 23 about those things. Now, when you study your Bible, you need to see the difference in the things that differ. You need to understand that Israel had a physical temple. Now, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 6, he says that we, the church, the body of Christ, are the temple of God. You see, the righteousness is not in the temple, physical temple. The righteousness of God is in the, the, the spiritual temple of our bodies. Mm -hmm. Because we are what? His body. So that's what we have to understand. we got to understand the things that... That, that different. In Israel's program uh, and, and prophecy, they had a physical temple. Now the temple dwells in us. Because the Spirit of God, even when you look at it, when they had the Ark of the Covenant, when it talks about the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, that the Ten Commandments will be placed in the Ark of the Covenant, and they always had to carry that around. Mm -hmm. And when they stole it, they stole it, and God punished those people who stole it. Then Solomon actually put it in, uh, put it in the temple when he built it. Right? So we see that it was always a physical thing. Now we understand that the Spirit of God now dwells, what, inside of a believer today. He doesn't just walk alongside of us like he did with the Ark of the Covenant, but he dwells inside. It's funny, I went and talked to a pastor, and he had a, a, a thing with the Ark of the Covenant on it. And so the Ark of the Covenant, it was, it was only to hold the Ten Commandments. Did it represent the Spirit of God? It, it represented the Spirit of God, which held the righteousness of God, which was back then the Ten Commandments. So it was the Spirit of God. That's why they always had to have it with them. But today, the Spirit of God is not in some man-made Ark of the Covenant. That's not our program. The, the Spirit of God dwells in us today. right? It didn't dwell in them back then. Uh, but I want you to see that those are some things that differ. The temple, they know that they're still going to the temple. Paul never told, tells us to go to the temple. He never tells us to go to the altar. He never tells us those things because that's not our program. Mm -hmm. Everything that we get today is spiritual. Israel was always physical. Uh, so, so that's why it says there, the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And it says, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried. Now, God writes it this way because this is a real person in a real event when it says a certain man. It was a real person in a real event, but when God, when God had it to uh, be written down, it speaks about the nation of Israel in some form, way, or some shape or another. It always talks about, whatever you see in your Bible where it says a certain man, a certain woman, uh, it's it was an actual event when it happened, 
And now what it speaks about is it's talking about the nation of Israel as a whole. And that's why God recorded it. And that's why he says it like, like he says it anytime you see it. Uh, most people, when they read it, they just think, well, it's just a certain somebody, you know. But, but, but it's always a shadow and a type of somebody apart in the nation of Israel. It was an actual event. But now when God has it written down, he's writing it down to show you that you are just like this person that, that, was, that, that it actually happened to. Mm -hmm. The nation of Israel, every time you see it, when you read and study your Bible, every time you see a certain man, a certain woman, read the story of the parable of what the certain man was and you'll be able to relate it to Israel every time. Every time. So let's see what this is. A certain man laying from his what? Mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Now, this man being lame, it means that what he couldn't walk. He was a type of Israel and how they cannot or did not have the strength to walk in God's law. Right? Because when, when, when God gave them the law through Moses back in Exodus, they did not have the strength. They were lame from the beginning because they didn't have the strength to walk in that law. Right? Because we know for 1,500 years they couldn't keep that law. Right? And it says from, uh, from, his, uh, from, from the mother's womb. Right? From, from the mother's womb there was lame. The mother being Jerusalem, the law. So even from Israel, from the mother's womb they were lame. They could not walk in God's law. So now what they're going to have to do is look toward Peter and John, who are the apostles now, and they're going to have to look towards them in order to gain strength. See that when, when if you notice the books of Hebrews to Revelation, look who, look who wrote the books of Hebrews to Revelation. Hebrews, we know God wrote it. Uh, he didn't give an author. But the next book you have is what? James. If, when you look at the book of Acts, you're going to see Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Because they're going to have to look out here to the apostles, and they're going to have to stay steadfast. We just read in Acts 2 and 42. They're going to have to stay steadfast on the apostles' doctrine. Mm -hmm. Then after James, then you got 1st and 2nd Peter. Then you got the book of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the book of Revelation. John wrote all of those books. They're all what? The Hebrew and Jewish apostles who are going to be talking to these people out here. So one thing we understand is that when we're studying is who wrote the book, why they wrote it, and who were they writing to. So if all of these authors out here are Jewish apostles, then how can these books out here be to us? Right? Because who is our apostle today? Paul. Paul. Because Paul says in Romans 11 and 13 that I am the apostle of the Gentiles and I magnify my office. Right? The only apostle that God gave the Gentiles is Paul. Nobody else was sent to the Gentiles except for Paul. The other 12 was, was sent to uh, uh, witness to the whole entire, all of the nations, but they were only to go to Israel first, right? So, but Paul is the only one that God sent out to go directly to the Gentiles and the nations. So as we see this, we're going to see that Peter is going to perform his first miracle. Because God wants to, the, the, the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles, but it's really the Act of the Holy Ghost working through the Apostles. Mm -hmm. So what the Holy Ghost is down, what it's going to do early in Acts now, is show how Peter is going to be the one that you're going to have to look towards because he is your Apostle. Right? So as we see this, we're going to see that. Uh, it says... The beautiful temple, which is called, uh, they said daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that enter into the temple. Now, the gate called beautiful has to do with the kingdom, right? It says a gate called beautiful, and it has to do a lot with the kingdom. And so as we see this issue, we're going to see that a certain man is Israel. They were lame from the mother's womb. Mm -hmm. They could not keep the law. And he was sitting at the gate of the, of the city called Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And Beautiful represents the kingdom. So what you're going to see here, what it's going to illustrate, is how Peter, their apostle, is going to deliver this man and bring him what? Give him the strength to walk in the law. And so he can enter into the gate, into the kingdom. That's what it's going to show here. So as we see this, uh, go with me to Psalms 48 real quick. Psalms 48. I want you to see this issue of the, 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 this city called Beautiful. Psalms 48. Psalms 48. And verse number 3. Psalms 48 and verse number 3. 
Psalms 48, verse 1. 48 and 1. It says, Great is the Lord and great is to be praised in the what city of our God and the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for what? Situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Mm -hmm. So you see this issue of beautiful. It's going to be, this is a prophetic song talking about Zion. And we know Zion is what? Heaven and earth and it's also Zion and, and, and uh, heaven and the heavenly places too. Paul says the deliverer is going to come to Zion. Uh, Isaiah says deliverer is going to come out of Zion. So mm -hmm. we know that Zion is heaven for us and it's also heaven on earth. Right? Go with me to Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52, verse 1. Isaiah 52, verse 1. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O what? Zion. Now we're talking about a certain what? Lame man who did not have the strength to walk in the law. Put on thy strength, put on thy what? Beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy what? City. Mm -hmm. For henceforth there shall no more come into the, the uncircumcised and the what? Unclean. Look at verse, drop down to verse 7. How what? Beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God, what? Reigneth. So when it talks about this issue of beautiful, it's a city and it's representative of that kingdom. Because as we read in Isaiah and Psalms, you see that it's all prophetic talking about this kingdom. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be beautiful, right? Uh, I, I was talking to somebody... Uh, and I had a conversation with them, and they said, uh, and I said, I, I, I was commenting on one of these YouTube videos, and, and I said, most uh, salvation has nothing to do with prosperity. Most people who preach prosperity uh, are preaching a gospel that is not in the Bible. And so somebody wrote me back and said, uh, so, uh, God, God, is, God is prosperity. What about the streets paved with gold and all this different stuff? And, I, and, I, I, and I, I asked her back, I said, what scripture is the streets paved with gold in? I said, what, what, what verse is that found there? And they answered me, and I said, exactly, that's not your program. So because that's not your program, because it talks about the kingdom and how the streets are going to be paved with gold, it, it gives no, no uh, uh, description about heaven. If you notice that, nowhere in your Bible it gives a description as to what it will be like. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the city paved with gold and all these different things. That is the earthly kingdom. That's, that's what it's talking about. Now, will we have cities paved with gold? I don't know because it's not according to Scripture. But I'm pretty sure heaven and where God is, what we get, is going to be beautiful. All right? So, so as, as we see that, I just want you to see that issue of beautiful and how this is all going to tie in. You've got a certain lame man who needs to look upon his apostle for strength. And who, who's going to be able to enter into that city? It says, verse 3, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple acts what? Alms, um, right? It's a type of Israel because they were beggars under that law, right? That law was, was weak and beggarly because of Israel's sin. And then, you know, they were destitute and lame under that law. So they would have to what? Sing who? Peter and John about to go into the temple and ask alms. And what Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on who? Uh, look on us. Right? Now, if you read the book of Acts and Peter is telling you to look on me, if you're not a type of the nation of Israel, he can't be talking to you. Right? So when people get this and read this, this, this little subtle details like that, if Peter is telling you to look up upon him, that is not your apostle. He is not sent directly to the Gentiles. He's sent to Israel first, then to the rest of the world, which that won't happen to out here. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, Explain that for me. What, what, what it says, what Peter is telling them is he's saying, look on us. Because their strength, uh, uh, their, uh, uh, their way of salvation for them is through their apostle, which is Peter at the time. So in scripture, when Peter is saying, look upon me, understand that he's not talking to Gentiles. 
He's only talking to the nation of Israel. Because we understand in Acts 3, there was still what? There were, what, there were 120 people, but at the end of Acts 2, it said how many people were added to the church? 3,000. 3,000, 5,000 is going to be at the end of chapter 4. So as we see this, there were 3,000 added to the church. And we know that all of those men that were there were what? Jews. Right? It may have been some proselytes, but for the most part, they're considered Jews. So everybody who was there were Jews. So that's who Peter was talking to, because Peter is always associated with the kingdom gospel. He is never associated with the body of Christ. Never. That's why you're going to see later in the book of Acts, you're not even going to hear about Peter. See, because the program is switching from law to grace. So Peter always has to be associated with this gospel out here. So as Paul comes on to say later in Acts 9 and so on, you're going to see Peter diminish. Because now it's not about Peter anymore. Because he's not the apostle of the righteousness of God today. It's only Paul. All right? So, so we're going to see that. Uh, verse 5. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to what? Receive something of them. Then Peter said. Notice it always says Peter said. John was there, but who's doing all the talking? Peter. Peter, Peter is the head apostle. That's why even when Jesus said, uh, who do men say that I am? He was asking Peter. And he said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And he said, and Peter, thou, I give thou the keys. So whatever you bind in, in the earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on the earth. He gave Peter that head apostleship. Right? So as we see this. Hey, Pastor, since you said that, uh -huh. why don't you expound on uh, what Jesus was talking about upon this rock? Because a lot of people think the rock, they're talking about Peter because his name means stone. Yeah. And they associate him with that. And, and, and when, you, when, when you look at it, it's really when you understand that scripture, what it's talking about, uh, Peter is a form, it, Peter means rock, but it's, it's the masculine word. Mm -hmm. And what Jesus was talking about was Petros, which is the feminine word of it. And because we know we, we, uh, when it talks about the church, the body of Christ, he says upon this truth, mm -hmm. I will build my church. Mm -hmm. Because what did he ask Peter? Who do men say that what? I, I am. And the answer was what? Thou art the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal that unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And upon this rock, upon that truth, I will build my church. Not upon Peter, as far as Petra, but Petra. It's, it, it's, a, it's a masculine word and a feminine word there. Uh, when you look it up in the Greek, it, 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 those are the separations. Peter's word means masculinity. It means Petra. Right? So uh, Petros, I mean, and Petra is the feminine word. Feminine word. Uh, Greek word for the for the word rock. So as we see that, we understand that. But it was upon the truth of Jesus Christ and who He was, He was going to build His church, right? It's upon that truth and only that truth, right? Not upon Peter. And it's it's funny how people will will read the scriptures and read into the scriptures something that's not even there, because He clearly says that upon this rock, upon this truth, I'll build my church. Not upon you, right? But, uh, but that was, that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, and look, look what Peter answers him. Verse 6. Verse 5, he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive some of them. Then Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, why did he say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk? From, from what we just previously talked about in Acts chapter 2 as far as the baptism is concerned. The water baptism. The Jew was to be baptized in the name of who? Was it the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost or the name of Jesus? The name of Jesus Christ. So when he tells them here, he says uh, in the name of who? Jesus Christ of Nazareth, because you got to understand, what Peter is explaining to them is that Jesus Christ, who you crucified, is your Messiah. Mm -hmm. He is that one, the Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So it's in his name, that's the power and the strength that you're going to get to rise up and walk. Now notice that this man was lame from birth. He's listening to his apostle who's given him the teaching of, of the truth of God's word at this particular dispensation. He's given him the truth, and now he's going to be able to what? Walk into that kingdom. Because he was sitting at the gate of called what? Beautiful, which represents the earthly kingdom. And now, because Peter didn't have anything to give him but the truth of God's word, now that's their strength. Right? 
That's the strength. That's what it's saying here. Verse 7. And he took him by the right hand, a sign of authority, right? Took him by the right hand and what? Lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received what? Immediately. Now he never could use his, his feet and ankle bones. Because he was laying from what? His mother's womb. That's how Israel was. But when they understand the message and what God has given them through Jesus Christ and his shed blood, whom they rejected, notice now we're still in that year of restitution. So that's why Peter is harping on them to listen. He got to get it right. In verse 2, we saw that he was telling them all the way back from David. The scriptures that they know, that Jesus, David was prophesying about the one you crucified, Jesus Christ. David is not going to sit on his throne because David's body is what? Still in the sepulchre. Mm -hmm. Right? We just read that. So now he's even giving them a, 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 a I guess a parable, so to speak, or a, a, a story about an event about uh, a lame man who's a type of Israel, who when you listen to the truth of God's word through Jesus Christ, who you crucified, that's how you're going to gain strength. That's how you're going to be able to walk into this kingdom. Right? And he had no ankle bones. He had immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Look at verse 8. And he what? Leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the what? The temple. The temple. Walking and leaping and what? Praising, Praising God. God. This is the type of Peter restoring the nation of Israel to walk into the kingdom of God. That's the whole purpose of this, is Peter restoring them that they may get their kingdom blessings as God promised them way back over here with their father Abraham. Mm -hmm. See, this is a type, that's why I said that certain land man is a type and shadow for them, because God is going to do for them what they couldn't do for themselves. That's why when you read uh, uh, Jeremiah 31, it says, God says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and I will write my laws on their hearts. So he's going to do for them what they could not do under the law, which they were laying from their mother's womb. Mm -hmm. Right? See, that this is a type and shadow of that. And he's going to give them strength to walk in his word through his son and through, through his apostles. And it's only talking to that believing remnant, that little flock. And it's going to be mostly talking to out here. Right? But we know in the context of scripture that it's talking about before that last year, before God canceled the, uh, not canceled, but for God uh, postponed their program. But that's why Peter is going to show up again in what? The, the ages to come. He rules the revelation. Because they're going to have to look toward him in this kingdom, to get to this kingdom. That's why it's all being, uh, it's a symbol and a type all right here. And, Israel, and, and most people don't like to hear this, but part of God's promise to Israel was instantaneous healing. Notice the day when you go to the doctor, you're not always completely healed. You've got to go to some type of treatment, you've got to take some type of medicine, and then you're healed. Because God never promised us healing. That was Israel's program. Now, can God heal you today? God can do whatever he wants. He can heal, but he didn't promise that to us. He promised that to the nation of Israel. He promised them that there will be no more sickness, no more pain, no more disease, Isaiah 35. He promised them these things. And this was a glimpse because the kingdom was already at hand and they rejected him. But now Jesus says he's giving them a year of what? Restitution to get it right. Mm -hmm. So what he's doing is still showing signs, miracles, and wonders in order to get them to believe. Because he promised them this. He promised them instantaneous healing. When you tell people that today, you know, they look at you like you're crazy. God can heal. I'm not saying he can't heal. I'm saying he didn't promise it to us. What he promised us is all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And we have that as an eternal present possession that men we trust the shed blood of Christ. He didn't promise us though, anything in this earth. That's why he's Paul said in Colossians 3, see those things which are above, not things on the earth. Our, our promises are spiritual and they're heavenly. Israel's promises are what? Earthly. The things have to do with physical things. Mm -hmm. That's why this is a type of him, them getting the physical healing, right? He promised us that the rapture will get a glorified body made like unto his to where we can't sin anymore. See, he, everything that God promised the body of Christ is all spiritual. Because uh, uh, the body of Christ did not form until Jesus Christ was in his what? 
glorified state. Before then, everything was prophesied before, and he came as a man on the earth. Even when he came, he was a man of the circumcision, so he didn't give this program of the mystery out until his glorified state. So everything we get is heavenly and it's spiritual. That's why even when it comes to baptism, Paul said in the first Corinthians 12 and 13, it's spiritual baptism. Right? Ephesians 4 and 5, he said there's one baptism. Now, what's the one baptism for us today? Spiritual. Because everything in our program is spiritual. Most people say, uh, well, you can get, we're baptized spiritually, but then you just get the water as an outward sign of an inward faith and all that. Listen, you're being baptized twice. There's no, it's no thing as two baptisms. You don't need them. Because the water baptism, you're essentially, the water baptism was a, was a type and a shadow of what we get right now. Because they will get, the water baptism was in preparation of what they will get out here. Mm -hmm. We get what they get, what they had as a symbol, we get that through the spirit baptism. See, the water baptism was only a symbol of what was to come. Because John said, I indeed baptize you with water to repentance, but there will come one after me who will whose shoes I'm not worthy to, to uh, unloose, who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You see? So the water baptism was just a symbol. Most people today, most Christians, we love the symbol. We don't need the symbol. Paul said in Colossians 2, we are complete in Christ. Mm -hmm. So we don't need the symbolism of water baptism and all these other symbols that they had. We don't need signs, miracles, and wonders. Everybody, oh, God performed this miracle. You don't need a miracle. The miracle has already been performed. He died to save your sins, knowing that you were going to raise hell on earth. Mm -hmm. And he died for that. That's a miracle. In itself. And even even in Israel's program, nobody was qualified to baptize nobody spiritually. Uh -huh. So the only person qualified to do a spiritual baptism is God himself. Uh -huh. That's why we are baptized into Christ. There you go. And, there you go. And, he, and when Jesus comes back, he's going to have to do the spiritual baptism. There you go. So they, I don't know why these guys think they're qualified to do these things. Exactly. And, and, and that's another thing that we... Uh, even with a lot of other things, tithing for one, you're not qualified to do these things because, in, like you said, with a spiritual baptism, you have to be qualified to do that. And so, since you can't do it, the water baptism is just, it means absolutely nothing to them. There was one instance in the scripture where somebody was really uh, baptized twice. That was Acts 19, when Paul asked the man, have you seen the Holy Ghost since you believed? <laughs> and they said, no, we've never even heard of any Holy Ghost. And Paul, well, Peter, well, Paul said, well, what were you baptized under? Under John's baptism. So that means they had the water, but now because Acts 19 is where God changed the program, Acts 9, they had to need the what? Spiritual baptism. Mm -hmm. You see that? Because the water baptism was not sufficient, especially not in this program today. So you don't need to be baptized twice. Right? All you need today is a spiritual baptism. But most people do that because it, they, first of all, they don't rightly divide. And the water is just like, oh, I'm giving away my sins. I'm showing the world. We don't need the symbolism of that, right? Uh, go with me to Isaiah 33 really quick. 33 and 24. I just want you to see something. I'm thinking about it. I mentioned it earlier, but I want you to see it. Isaiah 33? Isaiah 33 in the last verse. Let's go to 22 to get the context. Isaiah 33 and 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our what? Lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Save us. Mm -hmm. Thy tacklings are loose. They could not well strengthen their mass. They could not spread the sail. Then is the prey of a great spoil divided. The lame take what? The prey. The prey. And the inhabitants shall not say, I am what? Sick. Sick. The people that dwell therein in the kingdom shall be forgiven their what? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Right? Go, go with me to 35. Uh, 35 and... I, I just want to show you that all of this was a foreshadow of that kingdom when the, the ministry of the healing... When God healed all manner of sickness. Uh, 35 and verse 3. Isaiah. Isaiah 35 and verse 3. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. 
Then shall the lame man leap as a what? Heart. Mm -hmm. Now we we just saw Acts three that the man what? Leaped. Right. All of this is a prophecy and is being fulfilled in Acts 3 to get them to what? Believe that Jesus is that Messiah. Mm -hmm. Right? The lame man leaves us all and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams what? In the desert. In Israel, physical healings and forgiveness go together. Mm -hmm. That's why you notice in the other verse in Isaiah 33, 24, it says that they will have their what? Sins forgiven, their iniquities forgiven. But it also said that the lame man shall not say I am what? Sick. The inhabitant shall not say that I am sick. Israel's program is physical healings and forgiveness. When Jesus came healing all manner of sicknesses, he said, get up and walk, your sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, didn't you heal him? Why not just say, you know, get up and uh, uh, your sins are forgiven? He said, what's easier for me to say, take up that bed and walk, or your sins are forgiven? See, because in their program, this, the healing and the